Good morning and welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. If you're able, let's all stand as we turn to page number 491. Page number 491, Shelter in the Time of Storm. The Lord our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. Hold that last. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear. A shelter in the time of storm.
All right, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful um, for all that you've done for us. We're thankful, Lord, for the fact that we're saved. And, uh, Lord, that you sent your Son to die on a cross for our sins. We're thankful, Lord, for you going uh, with us through the darkest of times, through the toughest of times, for always holding our hand. Um, Lord, when we're struggling, when we're hurting, and, and uh, when we're scared, Lord, we're thankful for uh, the hope that we have in you and the joy that we can have in you and the peace that we can have in you. And uh, Lord, we're thankful for how you've blessed us, and we're thankful for the families that we have and, and this church family that we have. And we're thankful, uh, God, for a life of meaning and a life of purpose. We're thankful, Lord, for direction and guidance, and we're thankful for your word and that we get to hear from your word this morning, hear it preached. I pray, God, that you would have your hand over pastor as he preaches. I pray he'd fill with the Holy Spirit and use them in a tremendous way in our lives. And uh, God, I pray that you please would bless as we sing and, and as we direct our attention and our focus on you. I pray, God, that um, it wouldn't just be uh, us singing, but Lord, that we'd be praising you, that we'd be lifting you up and that we'd be thinking about what we're saying. And uh, Lord, that it'd be real to us this morning. And I pray, God, that um, you'd be with those who are discouraged who are here and uh, maybe who are hurting, maybe those who are frustrated. Uh, God, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to leave all of our burdens, all of our cares at the door. And, Lord, that we'd be able to come in here and we'd be able to be at peace with you and one another. And, uh, God, that you'd just be glorified. And, and Lord, that we just put our focus on you because there's no trouble in you. Uh, God, you're, you're perfect. You're awesome. You're amazing. You're mighty. You're in control. You are God. You are king. And, uh, Lord, you, you haven't lost sight of anything that's going on in the world. Lord, you know it all. And so, God, we can rest in you and we can have peace in you. And I pray, God, that you just bless this morning. And do a tremendous work, a work that only you can do. Help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to page number 34 in our hymn books. Page 34, Living by Faith. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know rule it for everything, and all of my worry is made. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting can joining with us on Zoom. We typically don't have too many people with us on Zoom for the 11 o'clock service. It's usually the 8 o'clock service that people join, 8.30 service, people join early. But praise the Lord you're here. We're glad you're here. And for those of you who are joining us via Facebook or the website, we're glad you're here as well. And uh, we have a growing family of people that are part of our services online. 
It's kind of a strange thing, but you know, you, I'll hear from people during the week that say, yeah, I watch the service, and, and um, there are people that are regulars that uh, are not here because of the virus just yet, but they're, uh, they're regularly attending the meetings via Facebook or, or Zoom or some other method. So anyway, we're, we're thrilled about that. I want to just make mention of a couple things. Um, for those of you who may be visiting with us online, or even if you're visiting with us uh, here in the church service, this would be very helpful to us. We don't hand out the visitor's cards anymore. We'll probably get started back doing that again. But um, if you're visiting with us, um, if you would go to the website, there's a button called My Response. And um, you can just, it'll ask you a bunch of questions if you have questions for us or if you just want more information about the church, or if you want us to connect with you and let you know some of the things that are going on here, um, you know, fill that out. You, you just really have to give us your, the only thing required is your email address. There's a lot of other questions that'll ask you. You give us whatever information you want to give us, but that'll be a help to us so we can communicate with you and give you the information you might need about services and what's going on, particularly with the virus and everything. You never can tell if, you know, something's going to get changed or shut down or whatever. And so, uh, anyway, that will help us out a lot. Also, uh, if you're a regular attender or a member of the church, um, the, uh, there's a button on there called church membership update or something like that, information update. If you could fill that out, we probably should make both of those buttons the same. That would probably be helpful, right? Because it's, it's asking for the same information. And so, so just fill that out and give us your updated information. I shared this morning that I send out, there are about 150 people or so that are on our regular weekly attendance list. And, um, and so I send out emails to all those people, but it, it's actually only about 75 emails that go out. So either that means they're small children that don't have email addresses or I don't have your email address. And so it, that would be very, very helpful for both of us. And so also I want to make mention, we had our book club on uh, Friday. Uh, we had the first meeting at our house. We had, I don't know, about 15 people or so that were at the house for fellowship. We had some people joining with us on Zoom, and so that worked out pretty well. And basically, it was the first meeting. We didn't have a book to discuss as far as past tense, a book we read last month. So we kind of discussed a little bit in detail uh, this book. We read a couple of passages out of it. Uh, you may not agree with everything, you know, I, I, if I share with some of my fundamental brethren that were reading Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, a lot of them are like, oh, you know, Lewis has got a lot of weird ideas. He does, but he's got a lot of great stuff also. And so there's no significance, by the way, to picking this book first. It's not like, well, this is the first book. It's just, I read this book just uh, a couple of weeks ago and it was a good book. I said, well, we'll do this book for the first book. So, uh, but it's a great book. And if you want to join us, uh, you, there's still time to do so. Uh, there's, a, there's a button on the website regarding the book club. You can click on that and fill out the little form there. We do have one extra book. You can get the book um, cheap as far as Kindle's concerned. Um, and on Audible, Miss uh, Sherry found us a website. If you ask Miss Sherry over there about it, she can hook you up with the website. There's a website where you can read it for free. And uh, so that's always nice also. Some people just really like the old-fashioned, you know, paper book. Uh, they're afraid the booger man's going to come and shut off all technology, and then we're not going to have anything but paper books. Um, but, uh, but anyway, this book, see Mr. Isan, he will uh, give you a copy of it. And then the other thing, real quick, is discipleship. Um, we, we're in our second week of kind of an overview of our discipleship program. And, um, and so Brother Derek's been teaching uh, discipleship. We had a joint meeting with all the Sunday school classes combined at the Wimberg building last week. This week, uh, it was just the people that were signed up and interested in, in participating in the discipleship program. So there's still time for you to sign up for that as well. If you'd like to be involved in that, we have about, I think, three or four more weeks of classes that we're going to be doing that kind of teach us how to go through discipleship, how to go about it. And so if you're interested in discipling somebody, uh, or if you're interested in going through discipleship, being a disciple, going through the 10 lessons, and when I say 10 lessons, it's not 10 weeks, it'll be more than that. Those lessons take a little more than, than a week to do each one of them. So uh, if you're interested in either one of those things, and discipleship basically means discipline one, um, and all of Jesus' followers were disciples, 
Sometimes we mix up apostles and disciples. All the apostles were disciples, but not all the disciples were apostles. There were 12 apostles, but there were many disciples. Disciple means disciplined followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn the basics of Christianity, what we believe, and how to practice our Christian faith in those discipleship lessons. If you're interested, go to the website and sign up. All right. I think that's all the business we'll take care of. Esau will give you some more later on when he does the announcements. But we're going to sing a song, number 22, Christ is all I need. Amen. Let's all stand. Page number 22, Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all. scripture reading. All right, good morning everybody. We're going to be in 2 Peter. 2 Peter, we're going to do our scripture reading this morning, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 5. I'll read 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then all together we'll read together verse 5. Once again, that's 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'll begin in verse 1. Simon Peter a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 5, all together. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Praise the Lord for the reading of his word as we sing another song. Amen. Remain standing as we turn to page number 39. It's number 39.
then just a couple of announcements. We're going to be starting up the children's music ministry, and that will start January 24th. Starting up January 24th, the children's music ministry. Miss, uh, Miss Liz and Mrs. Camilla will be starting music song, t- music song time during the Sunday school class for kids. The goal is to teach our children great songs that teach truths about the Lord that will remain in them with them throughout their lives. From time to time, they will be singing in the church services. We encourage parents to bring their children to Sunday school, which allows the parents to be part of the adult Bible classes that are held also during that time. Music time will be at the beginning of each Sunday school class, so it it is important that you have your children there on time at 945 in the morning. We're, We're also looking forward to what the Lord will do through this music ministry for the children of Jersey Shore Baptist Church. So if you have um, any questions about that, you can see Mrs. Liz or Mrs. Camillo, and they'll be happy to give you more information on that. Again, that's starting up January 24th at 945 here at the church. Blood drives coming up January 30th and February 11th. You can sign up and register for those on at the redcrossblood.org website. Look up the name of the church or the zip code here, and you can register for an appointment for that. Uh, men's breakfast February 6th here at the church at 730 a.m., Uh, Come enjoy some great fellowship, great food, and a great devotion. If you have any questions about that, you can see Brother Bob Fenton. And again, that's here at the church Saturday, February 6th at 7.30 a.m. Pastor mentioned the book club. We have an extra book if you're interested in in joining. Uh, It's not too late. You can sign up on the website. If you need help doing that, you can see me after the service, and I'll be happy to to show you how and um, uh, give you more information on that. Uh, the discipleship ministry, we're doing that during the Sunday school hour. Well, the disciples and the disciplers are going through the, the program right now on how to do the journey and student journey discipleship programs. If you have any questions about that, you can see uh, Brother Derek or Pastor, and um, they'd be happy to give you more information on that. And then the homeless ministry, Hope Through Grace, they hand out uh, care packages there in, in the Atlantic City area. Um, to the homeless there, they put together some care packages and hand out some uh, Wawa uh, breakfast sandwiches, and um, they're always looking for some donations as they put these packages together, and the list of items are right on the bulletin, which is on our website, and if you have any questions about that, you can see Mrs. Becker and Mrs. Darla Griffin um, about that homeless ministry, Hope Through Grace, and for those that are here, we have the giving, the offering box at the back of the church on the back wall, and for those that are watching online on Facebook, or by any other means, you can give through our website, jerseyshorebaptist.com. There's a giving link. There's a phone number that you can text to give, and there and you can always mail in your offering to the church, which the address is listed on our website. We're just going to take this time to pray for the offering. Lord, we thank you, God, for this morning, Lord. Thank you, God, for allowing us to be in your house. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to meet the needs of the church, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. Pray that we would be faithful to you with our tithes and our offerings. God, I pray, Lord, that you would bless it and multiply it, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd be with the missionaries, Lord, who are struggling financially, Lord, and churches out there, Lord. I pray, God, that you would bless them, that uh, you would uh, bring in the finances that they need, Lord. But, God, we pray that you would just continue to meet the needs of our church here. And, God, we thank you, Lord, for being so faithful to us, Lord. We pray, God, that you would bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Oh, junior church, you're dismissed. Which way are we going? This way? You're on the bus. I've heard that bus running for a while, so it should be nice and toasty out there. Second Peter, chapter 1. They just keep coming. All right, we've been going through um, First and Second Peter for the past several months. Obviously, we took a little bit of a break in, be- in between for the Christmas holidays. We had some messages on uh, Christmas and some messages on New Year's, but um, uh, for the fall season, basically, we were in First Peter, and we just recently started Second Peter, and uh, we, we were going through a little bit faster pace, maybe about uh, two messages per chapter. But uh, here in the first chapter of Second Peter, we're kind of bogged down, um, and it's going to take several weeks to get through um, this first chapter, and you'll see why here in a minute. And so, just a reminder, Peter is writing uh, both First and Second Peter during very, very crazy times in uh, the Roman Empire. He was specific. He specifically wrote First Peter. To the area of Asia Minor, there were some churches in that area, northern Asia Minor, Galatia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, that were going through a really difficult time. And of course, the whole Roman Empire was embroiled in difficult times. Christianity was not a popular religion. It was a religion that was persecuted um, tremendously by the Roman Empire. Nero hated Christians. He was the emperor at the time of Second Peter, for sure. Uh, probably at the time of First Peter also, 
and um, he persecuted Christians to the point where he put them to death. If you were caught practicing the Christian faith and, and refused to renounce your faith in Christ, um, he would put you to death. And so this was during the times or the days when, um, this was during the times in the days when they were you know, bringing uh, Christians into the Colosseum and they were, uh, you know, they were being fed to the lions and, uh, and being slaughtered in many, many strange and, and uh, barbaric ways. But this was the time that they were going through. Now, we're going through difficult times as well in 2021. And uh, certainly we would say, I, I, I think I stopped saying um, that I can't wait till 2020 is over and we get into 2021 because 2021 uh, so far doesn't look like it's much better than 2020. And so, uh, you know, hey, the Lord's in charge and this is the year that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it and God will give us the grace to get through uh, whatever it is we need to go through. But um, uh, these are crazy, perilous times that we're living in. And so, um, not as bad though as this first century. The first century was a time when people were, I mean, they were literally dying. I mean, people are dying today because of the virus, but in, in America today, um, there's not too many, I'm not going to say there's not any, but I don't think there's too many people that are dying because of their faith in Christ. Now, it is happening in other parts of the world today. Um, there are places where Christianity is, is you know, the, the nations are closed and, and Christianity is an enemy of the state and they are persecuting to that point in other places. And of course, this has happened uh, throughout the centuries. But by way of preparation, uh, First and Second Peter are good letters, books, whatever you want to call them for us to study at, at such a, for such a time as this. Because we are, you know, things are getting weird, and they may get weirder, and we need to be prepared for whatever might be coming. I hope it doesn't come. I hope, you know, a couple of months from now, everything's back to normal, and we're just, you know, uh, we're just living life in America as we always have. But, um, you know, the Bible does talk about crazy times. We don't know if this is the very, very end of the last days. We don't know that this is the, we're on the very, uh, the eve of Christ's return. We can't know that, but we know that things are advancing very quickly, technology and everything else, and the one world government and all the Bible talks about happening is, is happening right before our eyes. So we need to be prepared. And Peter prepared his readers, the Christians of the first century, for what they were facing. And I believe there are great principles in these letters that will prepare us. So last week, we, we, um, or for the last couple of weeks, we've been in this, um, this, uh, this second epistle general of Peter. And um, we talked about, we introduced the whole study a couple of weeks back. And uh, last week, we were in verse 5. Uh, Justin just read it a little bit ago, but let me read it again. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue into virtue knowledge. And, um, and then it goes on and lists these other things in verse 6, and to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. These are seven things that we're to add to our faith. In verse 1 it says, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So this is written to save people who have already established a relationship with Christ, they already have a baseline faith of salvation and um, of Christ, and they're saved, they have salvation. But then Peter says that there are things that we need to add to our faith, and he lists seven of those things. And we're week by week, we're looking at each one of them. We talked about virtue last week. Um, but he also said there that giving all diligence we are to add to our faith. And um, diligence is something we talked about in that first lesson, that overview lesson. It's something that, you know, diligence means we're going to take it very seriously. We're going to do it on purpose. It's not something we can just, you know, it's not going to just happen to us by accident. It's not something that's going to happen to us. It's something that we need to determine or purpose in our hearts is going to happen in our lives. And so we need to have diligence. I came across this illustration, which was a great illustration, I believe, of being diligent or purposeful about your life. And um, this was actually found on the wall of a missionary's house. 
he, uh, when he died, they went in and they were going through his things and they found this statement um, posted on the wall of his house. And it's a great statement. I wish it was completely my statement uh, because I've fallen short. I've, I certainly have not fulfilled this ideal as this missionary uh, may have. But anyway, here's what it says, and I'm, I'm assuming this was his statement. It says, I am a part of the fellowship of the committed. And that's what we talk about, diligence. We're committed. And he said, the fellowship of the committed to doing whatever it takes. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. I'm out of my comfort zone. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't back up, let up, slow down, or back away. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless streams, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, top, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by present, learn by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide reliable, and my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, or burn up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, stayed up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he comes, give until I drop, Preach until all, all know and work until he stops. And when he comes to get his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me because I've dedicated my life to being part of the fellowship of the committed, doing whatever it takes. And, uh, you know, it's my prayer for you and for me this morning is that we would join the fellowship of the committed and be willing to do whatever it takes to be with all diligence add to our faith these seven things. Now, these seven things that are spoken of, the Bible's very clear that if we're diligent about adding these things, we'll be rewarded for doing so. Uh, notice in verse 8, it says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll be fruitful if we add these things. Verse 10 says, we'll be secure. Notice at the end of that verse, it says, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Notice in verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So if we add these things diligently to our faith, not only will we uh, be fruitful, which means we'll the fruit of the Spirit will flow through us, but also we'll, our lives will impact other people, lost people, and influence them for Christ. But we'll be secure, which will understand the security we have in Christ, but also uh, we'll be secure in the moment. If you're secure in Christ, and you know that you're saved and secure in Christ, he read um, in the Sunday school class, 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God you may know that you have eternal life. When you know you belong to Christ, boy, that helps you in all the little steps along the way to stay on the right track. So you'll be secure, but not only that, um, you'll have an abundant entrance. I like that verse. An entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. I like the fact that we can have an abundant life, life more abundantly here on earth. But I also like the fact that our entrance into the kingdom, our entrance into heaven will be abundant as well. Now the other side of that is, so those are the things, the benefits, if you will, if we add these things diligently. But if we refuse to do so, look at verse 9. He that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now again, there's a lot of people that interpret this a little bit differently. 
And there's debate about what that actually means, but if they were purged from their sins, to me that indicates they were saved, but they've forgotten that they were saved. They don't act like they're saved. And sometimes we meet people that have, well, at least they made a profession of faith in Christ at one point in their life, but they don't act anything like the fact that they're saved. And so, anyway, so these are the promises, and these are the consequences of either adding or not adding these things to our faith. Now, last week, we looked at the first of those seven things that God said that we should add to our faith, and that was virtue. Besides this, given all diligence, verse 5 says, add to your faith virtue. And in that message, we looked at an explanation or a definition of virtue through the use of the word in the context of the New Testament. And we'll do the same thing in today's lesson as well as we talk about knowledge. But we discovered last week that the word virtue means a a moral excellence or purity. We said that a person that has virtue knows what is right and that person is willing to do it. They have enough godly character to do what's right. He fulfills fulfills her purpose as a Christian in glorifying the Lord and that's why we're here to glorify the Lord. Last week we also looked at some examples. We looked at Joseph. By the way, we're going to be talking a little bit about Joseph tonight in the evening service and... um, I don't know if, if you read the devotional blog for this morning, but it was uh, entitled Bereaved. And uh, the word bereaved, I got interested in a study on the word bereaved. Jacob said, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And uh, I, got a, I, I got to doing a study on that word bereaved, and it's really an interesting word, and we're going to talk about bereavement in the context of Jacob and his sons and Joseph and Benjamin, and all that, and how that sometimes bereavement, and we've all experienced bereavement, I guess to some degree or another, some more so than others, but uh, we're going to be talking about that. But we talked about Joseph. Joseph was an example of, of virtue uh, in the Old Testament. And, uh, and, then, uh, and so we also talked about how we can put uh, virtue to practice in our lives. Today, we're going to look at this next attribute, which is knowledge. It says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And we're going to talk about knowledge. Now, let's pray before we jump into this. Ask the Lord to bless. Father, I pray that you'd help us to clearly uh, give the understanding of what it means to have the kind of knowledge that the Bible's talking about here. Uh, we know that there are kind of different kinds of knowledge. The Bible says knowledge puffs up. What's that talking about? Is that uh, what we're supposed to do? Puff our minds up with that kind of knowledge? Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand exactly what you mean by this. And so, Lord, we pray you teach us the scriptures, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So the first thing we want to we want to look at is knowledge defined. What does it mean when the Bible talks about knowledge? Now, there are actually several different words that Greek words that have been translated into our English word knowledge. And each of them carry a slightly different meaning. By the way, let me just pause and say this. I believe our English Bible is a thousand percent correct. I have no issue whatsoever with the King James Bible. People say to me sometimes, well, why do you study the Greek at all? Because there's different nuances and meanings of words. And it's just interesting when you go back. The English, by the way, is more specific than the Greek in some areas. But the Greek sometimes is a little bit more specific as far as nuances than the English in some areas. The Greek is 100% accurate. There's no problem with it at all. The English is 100% accurate. There's no problem with it at all. But I believe if you have an open mind to this, you'll agree as we look at this, you'll see that when you study these words out, you were talking about words in, when you're writing out the scripture in discipleship. Brother Derek in the Sunday school class said, you know, we, we write the verses out word by word, and it, and it causes us to slow down and look at each word. The Bible says every jot and tittle is important, and so we look at each word, but you know, by doing these word studies that I do sometimes, man, I'm micro-analyzing every word in the scriptures. Now, I told Justin, we were talking about it this morning, um, you know, I was, I was saying, well, there's reasons why I do it, but the, the danger of doing that is you lose sight sometimes of the big picture. And so you got to back up every once in a while and see the big picture, but every once in a while also you got to narrow down and focus on the, I don't want to call it minutia because it almost makes it sound like it's unimportant, but the, the intricate little details that are contained within the text. So, but there are actually several different words that are translated into the word knowledge. 
And in the text that we're reading, in, in 2 Peter verses 1 through 11, is really our text, two of those words for knowledge are used. One of those words has to do with just knowing Him in a kind of a basic way through a relationship. The other has to do with knowing more about Him through deepening that relationship. It's a growing knowledge. It's not just, I know something. It's, I'm getting to know something more and more and in a deeper way. And so, the first word we'll look at is the word epigenosis. It's, uh, it's, it, it means, I recognize or I acknowledge. And I'll give you the, the verses here. So, in verse 2, 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. And of Jesus our Lord. That's a basic flat line knowledge. I know about something. Verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. That pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So that's just talking about a basic flat line knowledge. Hey I've come to know Jesus Christ as my savior. And I know him. I have a relationship with him. We've, we've started a relationship. Um. And then in, in verse 8, it says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In all of those verses that we just discussed, in verse 2, 3, and 8, the word translated knowledge is epigenosis. It's, it's gnosis with this little epi in there. And that's how the Greek works. You have one stem, and then it depends on the the suffix at the end or the prefix at the beginning, and sometimes they'll stretch out the stem itself that will give the different nuances of meaning of the word. And so, but um, it's, it's epigenosis, and what he's saying is, is there, it means a precise, exact, or full knowledge. Um, I used this illustration this morning about, uh, we were talking to, there's a guy that we, we know, uh, you may know him, I don't know if you know him or not, but um, he's a guy we're familiar with, he's a pastor, he used to be a youth pastor, he's out, actually out of Pastor Phelan's church, he pastors up in North Jersey, and he's actually running for governor, or will be running for governor in New Jersey, and his name is Phil Rizzo, and um, he was, um, there was a couple other guys running that were like the front runners, and and they've kind of stepped out of the race, and so really the, there's like not really a big guy out there that's going up, up against Governor Murphy in November. It's this year, the election, which I thought it would be two years, but it's this year. And so the primary's coming up and everything else. Well, he's in the process of trying to figure out if he's actually going to run within the next couple of weeks. So uh, he called the other day, and we were talking for a while, and I said, I'd like to hook up. Uh, Van Drew, and he asked me, do you know him? And, okay, here's an illustration of the word. Yeah, I, I know him. I, I've met him twice. Many of you have. Sam, you've met him. Justin, you've met him. You guys, Dawson, you were with us last year too, right? You met him. This is actually, um, I've met him twice. So I've met him, I know him. But that's a one level of knowing something. Um, he probably doesn't know me, <laughs> but he has met me. But that's one level. But what he's talking about here, about the knowledge that we need to add to our faith, it's, it's a deeper knowledge. It's a deepening knowledge. And so I could say I know Jeff Van Drew and I do know him, but I can also say I know my wife. That's a different kind of knowledge. That's a knowledge that's both epigenosis, a flatline level, but also a gnosis, a deepening level. Because, and that's why, by the way, the Bible uses the word Adam knew his wife. The word knew, it, it's there speaking of intimacy, of physical intimacy. The men of Sodom wanted to know the two angels. What did they, what they were saying? It was a sick kind of physical intimacy that they wanted to have, but the word know is used. So it's a deepening knowledge. Now here, obviously, it's not talking about physical intimacy, but it is talking about a spiritual intimacy. So the other word, we talked about epignosis, which is a flatline knowledge, but then the other word is gnosis, which means to come to know. It's got this idea of, okay, it had a starting point, but it continues on. See, some things are punctiliar. It happens in the past and it, and it just stays there. But some things happen in the past and there's continuing effects. 
And that's the type of word this word gnosis is. In verse 5, it's giving all diligence, add to your faith, knowledge. And, and to knowledge, temperance. That's the word there. And the word here has the idea of gaining or increasing knowledge, investigating, knowing things intimately, gaining all facts. If I were to say again by way of illustration, I know Brother Justin, I would use the, the word epigenosis. I'm stating that I recognize him or I have a relationship with him. However, if I, was to, if I was to say I want to get to know Brother Justin better, I would use the word gnosko because my knowledge of him is incomplete and I want to increase it. So let's go back to the passage. In verse 2, 3, and 8, knowledge is used expressing a complete package. I have knowledge of Christ. I know him. I have a relationship with him. In verses 5 and 6, the word knowledge is used to represent an increasing or growing awareness of the principles surrounding my relationship with. It speaks of an intimacy with him. And there's a lot of examples we can use in, in the rest of the Bible. Those were just from 2 Peter. But in, in other places, for instance, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 2, I'll give you some examples of the basic knowledge, the flatline knowledge, the, the entrance of a relationship. That would be epigenosis. It says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That's epigenosis. Ephesians 4.13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge. So that's a flatline uh, knowledge of the Son of God, an entrance into the relationship. 1 Timothy 2.4, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge, epigenosis of the truth. That you want to get people to the point where they've entered into that relationship, where they're at that flat baseline thing. Now, do we want them to grow in that relationship? We do, and that's the other word. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to that flat baseline level, the knowledge, epigenosis of the truth. Now, the other word, gnosis, you find it in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So here, it defines itself. Grow in grace and in the knowledge. So the word gnosis has the idea of growing knowledge. More intimacy. Skip down... Um, Kyle or whoever's doing the, the slides up there to um, verse um, chapter of Philippians 3.10. Look what, look what it says here. They'll put it up on the screen for you. This is, the, this is the verse that really tells the story. Paul said this to the church at Philippi. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now what's he saying there? Did Paul already know Christ? Did he all of a sudden, you know, did it dawn on him uh, when he's writing one of the prison epistles? He's in jail for Christ after three missionary journeys. You know, I want to I wanna know him. I don't know him. I want to know him. No, he knew him. He had a relationship with Christ, but he wanted to get to know him in a deeper way. And what did that mean, the deeper way? He wanted to get involved in him. He wanted to know the power of his resurrection the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So Paul already had a relationship with him, but he wanted to get to know him better, deeper. He wanted to increase what he knew about him. So in our text today, God is saying to those of us who already know him, we already have a relationship with him. We already have faith in Christ. He's telling us that we need to get to know him better. We need to increase our knowledge of him. And again, if you're saved, you already know him because you have a relationship with him through salvation. But now that you are saved, you, knew, you need to grow. 2 Peter 3.18 says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this morning, I, I just want to give you three practical things about adding knowledge to your faith. The first is this, how are we going to add knowledge, gnosis knowledge? deeper intimacy, deeper truths. And um, by the way, don't, don't get thrown off by that. Some, they used to use the phrase deeper life. You know, you, and then the fundamentalists who are big into the practical aspects of Christianity, soul winning and all those things, discipleship, they sometimes say, well, you're not one of those deeper lifers. 
And, you know, people used to hide away from the deeper lifers. And, and I know what they were saying. You don't want to be one of these guys that all you do is sit around micro-analyzing the Bible, but you don't ever do anything with your faith. So that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about we're going to study, 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 just so we can brag about how much we know about the, the Bible. Um, but, but somebody once said that to Pastor Clark. They said, what do you want to be? You're not one of those deeper lifers, are you? And he said, well, what do, I, do I want to be a shallow lifer? Do I want to be one of these guys that doesn't know anything about the Bible and just start spouting off about things that they don't know half of what they're talking about? I want to know the scriptures. I want to get to know Christ in a deeper way all the time. But how are we going to do that? Well, it begins in our daily devotion. Like I shared earlier, I got to know my wife through spending time with her. I listened to her as she shared with me her life, her experiences. By the way, one of the dangers is, is you get to know somebody over a long, long period of time, you know almost everything about them. And the danger of that is, is you stop communicating because it's not like you're trying to find out some story from the childhood or whatever. One of the interesting things is, is the more you communicate, if you keep communicating, you do discover things that, man, I've, I've been married for 36 years and, and I didn't know that. Uh, I never knew that. And you discover things. And so that's why we got to keep communicating. But I got to know her through devotion, devoting time with her. And I know her perhaps more than any other human being on the earth. Why? I've spent more time with her than any other human being on the earth has spent time, including her parents. It's kind of a weird thing, but I've known my wife longer than anybody has known my wife. Uh, well, no, I guess it's not true. Her brothers, I guess, have known her as long, but they don't know her as well. They haven't spent nearly as much one-on-one -on -one time with her as I have. And so, but it's the same uh, with our relationship with Christ. You must daily spend time devotionally, meaning you devote time to be alone with your Savior. And you got to carve out time. It, it gets hard sometimes um, to read His Word devotionally and to communicate to Him through prayer devotionally. You got to go through the day with Him too. Like my, my wife and I don't always communicate. In other words, we're not always... Um, you know, directly having a conversation, but we spend our lives together. And um, you need to spend your life and spend your day with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you the question, what time right now do you devote uh, to adding knowledge to your faith through daily communicating with your God? Uh, him to you through the reading of the scriptures, you're reading God's word together. And you to Him through prayer. Uh, how much devotional time, how much intimacy is there between you and Him? Listen, you need to get away from this whole thing. Well, I need to read this book because this book became, uh, contains theological facts that I need to know about because of my... No, this is a love book, a love letter from God to you that you need to read and absorb, not just in your mind, but in your heart. And um, man, it's so critical that we're daily in the Word. They changed the name from daily in the Word to journey, but it was daily in the Word at one time that we're daily in the Word of God. The Bible has so much to say about spending time with God through Bible reading and through prayer. Psalm 119, 105, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus actually speaking to the devil said, uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The psalmist said this about prayer. He said, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. You know, there's a lot of things in that verse. First of all, we see, I believe it was David. I'm not sure, though. Psalm 55, the writer. Um, but he, he, he spent a lot of time communicating to God. But there was another aspect of that that sometimes we never point out, the fact that he says declaratively, he shall hear my voice. God will listen to me. Uh, sometimes, have you ever prayed and you wondered if God is listening? He knew God would listen to what he had to say because he had a relationship with God. Job said this, he said, neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Listen, I want to challenge you. We're early into, into 2021, and it's a crazy year. It's probably going to get crazier. Get in the Word of God. Carve out time. And listen, I, I get it. 
there's a lot of things that can distract you. And, and we're busy people. We, we got a lot going on in our lives. Listen, don't let anything distract you away from time spent daily with the Lord Jesus Christ and maybe multiple times daily with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, somebody once challenged me to do this. I don't do it, but I mean, I'm, I spend quite a bit of time in prayer now, but somebody once challenged me to set my watch for different times during the day and when the thing goes off, just stop and pray. You know, I'm, and I'm not saying if you're in the middle of a business meeting somewhere, you, 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 you get down on your knees and say, oh, wait, everybody, we gotta, we gotta pray. But you can just pray. If you're not speaking, you know, you're, you could sit there and pray. Say, God, bless this guy. I don't know if this guy that's talking is saved, but I pray for his salvation. I pray for his family. I pray for God for you to protect him. There's a lot of things we could pray for. Set little reminders to remind you to pray. But this is devotion. And again, you wouldn't have to do that with your girlfriend or your new wife. You would automatically be texting during that business meeting, expressing your devotion to her. But that's why you got to kind of kindle this and do it on purpose. And that's why we're to diligently add this to our faith through daily devotion and then through diligent investigation. We're talking about uh, diligently adding knowledge. So you have to, on purpose, diligently investigate the Word of God. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. In 2 Timothy, Paul, writing to Timothy, this was Paul's swan song, just like Peter's swan song, if you will, is 2 Peter. This was the last recorded letter we have from, from Paul. And in 2, P, uh, 2 Timothy, rather, chapter 3 and verse 14, he tells Timothy, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. So he was taught the Scriptures as a child, but he continued to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he grew. And then he says, Those Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation... Through faith which is in Christ Jesus, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly or completely, totally, completely furnished unto all good works. We need to study the Bible. You need to be a student of the Bible. Say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to be in the ministry. Listen, first of all, every Christian is in the ministry. But second of all, every Christian should be a student of the Word of God. And uh, we can study corporately through Sunday school, through church services, discipleship, even a Bible institute. It's always been my dream to get a Bible institute up and running here. And we do have the Bible institute Sunday school class, but I would love to have just like the old school of the scriptures. Uh, we used to have at uh, Solid Rock, they had something called the school of the scriptures. They keep talking about starting it back up again, calling it night vision. The college is Vision Baptist College. They're going to call it night vision. And I thought that was, a, it'd be worth starting just because of the name, night vision. But, um, you know, they had uh, three classes and uh, the best part were the hot dogs. They had a little break and they had hot dogs. And usually I came right from work, went to two, or two classes or one class, and then, then they had the little intermission there with the hot dogs. I was starving by the time the hot dogs came out. And uh, so they had hot dogs. But it was just great, studying the Bible together. Doc Fidena was there teaching. I eventually taught. I was a student there, but then eventually I was a teacher there. Um, and all, a whole host of Brother Yanizzi taught there, Pastor Clark. It was just great and study corporately, but we all, we need to study topically also, uh, find out what the Bible says about different topics of the scripture, you know, like you can look up anger, you know, and get a topical Bible, what does the Bible have to say about anger from Genesis to Revelation, and look all those things up, marriage, child rearing, finances, you name the topic, the Bible is replete with great principles, information that will help you, study expositionally, Go verse by verse through passage of Scripture, deeply analyzing, letting the Bible speak for itself rather than looking for something, you know, like in topical, you're kind of looking for a verse that meets your topic. But when you study expositionally, you're just kind of letting the Bible, you're letting God speak for himself. Study diligently, um, you know, so that you'll be able to effectively teach what you learn to others. Study practically. We want to put these principles to practice in our life. We don't just learn knowledge. We, we, we put it to good use in our life. And so we want to do uh, through diligent investigation. And then thirdly and lastly, 
through dutiful application. We read a verse, we read a verse earlier that said knowledge, gnosis, puffs up. So we don't want to add knowledge to our faith just for the sake of increasing knowledge. Um, we want to add knowledge to our faith so that we can get to know him better and so that we can put what we learn to good use in our lives. Uh, and by the way, and in the lives of others. So it's all practical. We're, we're here, again, I share this illustration often. We could do everything we do better in heaven. But, but God wants us to put to use what he teaches us here on earth so we can be a blessing to other people. And so again, Christianity is not just about, you know, oh, we come to church and that's it. No, and it's not just even about um, living that life in front of your family and that's it. I mean, it's getting out into the highways, hedges, streets, and lanes of the city and influencing other people for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we want to put it to good use. We want to become more effective as ambassadors for the Lord Jesus. We want to be, as the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy also in chapter 2, meet for the Master's use, uh, prepared unto every good work. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, he talked about works that were ordained for us. We want to be better husbands to our wives, better fathers to our children, better employees to our employers, better citizens in our nation. And can I say this? We need a whole lot more better citizens in our nation right now. But we want to be those things. And if we use knowledge um, that we are given, I believe God will give us more knowledge. I, I believe the reason why people don't learn is because people don't use what they've already learned. So again, one of the keys to adding knowledge is using the knowledge that he already gave you. Now listen, God wouldn't command you to do this, this adding knowledge to your faith unless it was entirely possible. This is not something, well, I'm not smart. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to learn the scriptures like the next guy. Forget about the next guy. You can learn whatever it is God wants you to learn, and God will teach you. Every Christian can grow. Every Christian can add knowledge to his faith. The only thing that's stopping you is you. Maybe it's distraction. Maybe it's misplaced priorities. Maybe it's laziness. But you need to figure out what, what is keeping you from obeying the Lord's command. And listen, don't be lazy about this. You have to take the necessary steps to daily and devotionally know more about your Lord. And then diligently investigate those principles from the Word of God with the determination that you're going to dutifully apply those principles to your life. I'll close with this illustration. Many of you know the name George Mueller. George Mueller is one of the, uh, one of the great heroes of the faith. He was back in the 1800s uh, in England. And he had a great orphanage. That's what I guess he's most known for. But he was a pastor also of a, of a large church. But anyway, somebody uh, once asked him the question about Bible reading and spending time with the Lord. And the statement starts like this. It says, is reading the Bible a necessary part of your day or does it have a low priority in your life? George Mueller, asked, after having read the Bible through 100 times with increasing delight. He had already read the Bible through in his Christian life a hundred times. He made this statement. He said this, he said, I look upon it as a lost day when I have not had a good time over the Word of God. Friends often say, I have so much to do, so many people to see, I cannot find time for scripture study. Perhaps there are not many who have more to do than I, as Mueller's speaking, I, that have more to do than I. For more than half a century, I've never known one day when I had not had more business than I could possibly get through. For four years, I have had annually about 30,000 letters. Back in those days, it wasn't email, text messages, it was letters. 30,000 letters a year, and most of these have passed through my own hands. Then, as pastor of a church with 1,200 believers, great has been my care. Besides, I have had charge of five immense orphanages, also at my publishing depot, the printing and circulating of millions of tracts, books, and Bibles. But I have always made it a rule never to begin work until I have had a good season with God and His Word. The blessing I have received has been wonderful. Listen, I don't know if you uh, have less time or more time than George Mueller, but he was a busy guy. And he made it a priority, and he already read the Bible through a hundred times. So some of you would say, well, I've read the Bible. I've already read it. I don't need to read it again. Uh, it's not that kind of a book. 
Uh, you get a chemistry book, don't even read it. Read whatever you got to read to get through it and to get a passing grade and then throw it out or burn it or do something with it. But when it comes to God's Word, it's something you need to invest your time in and daily. And so God wants us to diligently add knowledge to our faith. Knowledge is one of these seven very critical and important things that we need in addition to our salvation. And these things will help us to fulfill God's will for our life. If we don't add knowledge and these other things, we're going to miss out on a great deal of what God wants us to have. But if we are faithful and diligent and we do put these things into our life, add these things, if we do build upon our faith by putting these things in our life, we will have everything that we need to succeed in these crazy, perilous last days. Many of us are fearful about what's going to happen. Or at least we're concerned. I think all of us should be concerned. Many are fearful. Some are consumed with fear. Listen, get in, add these things. I mean, God, God is the absence of fear. Because when you are wrapped in the arms of God, you're not worried about it. I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm not saying you're not careful. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm just saying you are not, God has not given us the spirit of fear. That comes from Satan. And so in these crazy last days, this is what we need. Giving all diligence, add to your faith. Virtue, we learned that last week. And this week we, we're going to add another one, knowledge. And if you'll diligently do that, boy, God will transform your life. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us in this matter of diligently adding virtue and now faith uh, and now uh, knowledge to our lives. And God, I pray that you would help us, dear God, to realize the importance of being uh, in a place where we can intimately get to know you and your word better. God, help us to carve out of the craziness and busyness of our day-to-day -day lives specific time that is devoted to you. Just as we were very careful when we were dating and especially in those early years of our relationship with our spouses, we devoted time just to get away from everybody else and to spend time exclusively one-on-one. -on -one. I pray, God, that we would do that with you. And I pray we wouldn't let maybe the years of our relationship cause us to fall less in love with you. And so, God, help us to be devoted to you and to get to know you on a more intimate, on a deeper basis. I pray you'd help us with that. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. We'll have a moment of invitation. If God spoke to your heart about, well, about anything, the altar is open. And you can pray at your seat. You can pray up at the altar. You can pray wherever you want to pray. But um, listen, if God's speaking to your heart about anything, if the Holy Spirit of God uh, pricked you at all about something that you might need to do, Boy, I tell you what, even in the quietness of the moment right now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, why don't you just give that over to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, you hit me with that one. And uh, that's something I need to work on. Help me with it. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And uh, the message was to Christians where to, we, we already have like precious faith. We're to add to our faith. We're talking about those who already have salvation. But you might be here, you may be watching via the live stream and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Listen, I want to challenge you. Don't leave this building and don't leave your computer if you're at home without finding out what the Bible has to say about salvation. If you're here with us in the auditorium, I could take the Bible and show you from the Scriptures how you can know for sure that you can go to heaven when you die. I quoted that verse a little earlier. If you're watching via the live stream, there's a little button on our website. It says, Why Jesus? If you click on that button, it'll give you a lot of verses. Not all the verses, but a lot of information, a lot of verses from the Scripture that deal exclusively with salvation. Now, also, we would appreciate it if you're looking into that and you're not sure that you're saved. Hey, contact us. Hit that My Response button and let us know what's going on in your life. If you need a little bit of help, we would love to communicate back with you. We won't bother you. We won't pester you. I won't blow up your email box, but I'll, we'll communicate with you at whatever level you want us to about your need for Christ and about your growth in the Christian life after you're saved, if that's your need. Whatever your need is, please let us know. And again, if you're here in the auditorium, listen, I'll be here. I'll be standing around. 
I'll give you till five o'clock tonight because that's when I got to be back here for the message. But I'll give you all the time in the world to talk to you about the Lord. But you have to make that first move. I'm not going to force you. Jesus wouldn't force you. He invites you. And I'm inviting you if you're not sure about your salvation. Get it settled today. I'd love to talk to you about it. Amen. We're going to close our service out with our chorus. We'll run the race. We'll run the race. We will pass on. Keep up the pace. Don't quit today. Encourage those along the way. Continue on in Jesus' name. Our strength to run is in Christ alone. We'll fix our eyes on Jesus' face. The one who saved us by his grace. Amen and you are dismissed.